Fighting Blindness Canada's Viewpoint is a virtual education series that brings you the latest in vision research presented by health experts from across Canada. The webinar you're about to watch is a recording. To learn more about the research we fund and upcoming webinars and events, please visit our website at fightingblindness.ca. This Viewpoint webinar is proudly presented by Bayer and supported by AGTC, Allergan and Abvi Company, Miara GTX, Novartis, and Roche. We'd also like to thank Accessible Media Inc., our national media partner. Everyone here should download the AMI app, which is a fabulous resource. And you can watch excellent programming, including previous Fighting Blindness Canada events. Thank you for watching. We hope you enjoy this webinar and share your thoughts with us in the comment section below. Okay, so our first panel discussion uh, this morning, we're going to be talking about some of the main causes of age-related vision loss. Uh, age-related macular degeneration, or AMD, uh, glaucoma, and cataracts. So we're joined by three experts in their field, uh, Dr. Andrew Merker, uh, who's going to be speaking about AMD, Dr. Kulbera Gill, who will be speaking about glaucoma, and Dr. Jean Chuo, who will be talking about cataracts. So I think we'll start uh, down at the end there with Dr. Merker. Uh, Dr. Merker is a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences at the University of British Columbia, and his interests and research are focused um, on macular diseases, including AMD. So welcome, Dr. Merker. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Okay, so why don't we just start out with what is AMD? What is age-related macular degeneration, and who's at risk for this condition? Um, so, you know, I, I put together some slides that I, I can't resist, I guess. So, um, it just, sometimes these things are, they're very visual and no pun intended. You need to sort of see um, the eye itself. So it's the most common cause of vision loss in, in people over the age of 55. Um, it's, a, it's a huge cause of morbidity and, um, and it's something that uh, we had some exciting breakthroughs for, but we have continued work to do. Um, it's going to double over the next 25 years in terms of the, the population that will be suffering from this or afflicted by it. Um, there's a short video here that I, I put together. I think it'd be good for all of us. It sort of just goes through the eye a little bit. I don't know how to play it, though. Do you guys, is it able to play? <coughs> if not, I can talk us through. Oh. Oh. Maybe, don't worry about the sounds. So I, I could probably do the, um, I just wanted the illustrations. So the eye is a, oh, it's, it's not, even, you can, oh, there you go. So there's a picture of the eye here and it's focusing the light on the retina right in the central vision. And the central vision is where macular degeneration is, is mostly uh, causes its problems. And you, you start off with some distortion or missing spots in the vision um, and that can progressively uh, become a large area of missing vision in your central vision, affecting reading and facial recognition and fine detailed work. The rest of the retina, about 90% of it, is involved in peripheral vision, and that's, that's where glaucoma is affected, retinitis pigmentosa is a, a, another classic uh, disease of the peripheral vision. Glaucoma can, can also affect central vision. I'll, I'll leave that to Dr. Gill. But um, in the, the peripheral retina, uh, it is very good for, for motion sensing as well and night, and night vision. Now, in macular degeneration, in the very back of the eye, the retina there, we start developing these deposits you may have heard of called drusen. Um, and that's, that's a common first feature of macular degeneration. Um, and almost everybody gets some form of that. So you'll hear terms like dry and wet macular degeneration. But most commonly, everybody has some element of the dry type. And it progresses um, over time. And mo most people um, don't have vision loss. So about 10% will go on to have some vision loss, but 90% won't. Of the 10%, 10% um, will lose, um, uh, half of them will lose vision related to the dry macular de degeneration getting worse. And the other half will lose it um, secondary to a new blood vessel, as you can see in this video, growing under the retina. And that can leak fluid and blood and really impair the vision, causing a sudden vision loss. Now, for the dry type, there's really no treatment. Um, at this time, there are a lot of exciting new developments um, and potentially new treatments coming up, with a lot of trials that we're working on. 
Um, but we, we put patients on vitamins because it reduces the risk of severe vision loss. So vitamins are very important. When we get to the wet macular degeneration stage and these new blood vessels are there, in those patients we have very, very effective treatments. And there's multiple. It started with laser and it moved on to sort of a, uh, an interesting sort of laser chemical interaction. And now we're into these injections um, that m many of you have heard of or many of you have actually been through yourself. And these injections have been fabulous in terms of stabilizing the condition, well over 95% of people. Uh, there's 5% that get worse. Um, there's also patients that come in a little bit late because they don't know why they're having vision loss. They assume it's cataract related or, or something else is going on. And by the time they get to us, um, it's a bit late. And the best predictor of a good outcome with treatment is the vision that you come in with. Um, and so, keep going here. So there are some risk factors. The risk factors that we can't change are our genetics, and that's a major risk factor here. Um, age, gender, so females tend to get more than males. Smoking is a major risk factor, and, and obesity as well. Um, there's lots of genes that, that we're finding more and more every day, but it was actually one of the first um, genome-wide associated. So one of the first genetic uh, examples of what we call, call very difficult polygenetic diseases. Uh, I can't seem to forward it any further. <laughs> I'm probably speaking too long. At any rate, this is just a picture of what we would see inside the eye. So at the very top left, we have a normal eye. It's hard to see with the lights on. The, there's the drusen that are circled over here. Um, that's how sort of the dry macular degeneration typically starts. And then it can progress in 10% of patients into the dry type where you get vision loss that's irreversible at the present time, or into the wet type where we get some bleeding. And if we catch people very early, we can stabilize 95%, 40% we can improve. And that, that's an amazing feat. Now we still have a long way to go, but, but uh, it's an incredible, incredible first step, or, or not first step, but next step. Um, if it's not caught early enough, we get a scar, and, and that scarring process, we don't, don't have the ability to reverse at this time. Um, this goes to what I've already said about that 90% of it is, is the dry type and without much vision loss, but 10% will have significant vision loss from progression of the dry or development of new blood vessels we call wet macular degeneration, and, and it has tremendous impacts on people's lives. Um, in, in terms of quality of life, um, people rate it, rate it up there with prostate cancer that's very advanced. Um, so it's very severe conditions. Um, it's, a very, it's a very challenging thing. And it's a very individual. Um, and as you can see, the population as well. So we have those therapies I talked about. There was originally laser therapies, and we've moved now into these injections, which are far superior, but we've got a long way to go. Um, and this is some of the names of the medications that some of you may, may have yourself or be getting yourself or may have heard about, but there's some new ones that have recently uh, been approved, and that's the presentation. So any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Fantastic. Well, we're going to do Q&A at the end, but I have a couple questions for you as well. Um, so, you know, you talked a little bit about the injections that people get for the wet form of AMD. Um, and there are several different medications you listed there. So what are the differences between these medications and how do you, as a physician, decide what medication to put someone on? So it's a good question. Um, we tend to have a, a bit of a routine to most people do it, I think, across the world. And we start off with, I'll put up the list of the medications there. So we, we usually start with uh, the medication called Avastin, um, which was one of the first ones that was used um, people get confused about on-label, off-label um, designation. So it's not FDA on-label for approved for macular degeneration, but we, we have the longest evidence with Avastin and it's incredibly effective. And it also happens to be very, very um, price cost effective for governments. And so the vast majority of patients do very well on Avastin. Um, but we're fortunate now. So we start most patients on Avastin um, unless they, they have some known allergy or other issues. Um, but there are some newer medications. So after Avastin came, well, there's Macugen as well, which no longer is being used. I think they stopped producing it. Um, but there's Lucentis, which really we haven't seen any difference between Avastin and Lucentis. So that, that wasn't ever um, shown. And there were a lot of trials done by the National Institute of Health 
comparing them. So they're very comparable. And the latest one that's very popular right now is, is ILEA, um, which is also, also out there. And it's really indicated for, for use every two months. So you get a bit more length in between treatments. The reality is we tend to be using it monthly because patients just need, those patients need a bit more uh, medication. So ILEA is, is the latest. And then lately we've had BioView, um, which can last up to say three, four months. And now Ferizumab, which is four months and longer. Um, but in terms of the final outcomes, we haven't seen much difference in terms of the vision. We're, ju we're just trying to get now longer duration and better quality of life for people. That's probably too much. No, that, that's great. Um, so uh, the other thing you mentioned is about the interval that people take these medications. Is it the same for everyone or do different people have different lengths of time that they need to go between injections? Yeah, that's a very good question. So in terms of, oh, there you are, by the way. I was looking for you over there, <laughs> trying to find you this mysterious voice. So nice to see you. There you are. Um, yes, yeah, so now I can actually look at you and answer the question. Okay. Um, yeah, so in terms of intervals, we start everybody monthly. Um, there's a loading period. Um, after the monthly phase, um, you know, the, the studies, the research is done very strict, and so it's usually monthly or bi-monthly for um, I lay on the other medications. But we start monthly for a loading period, and then we individualize to each person. Um, everybody's different, and we treat accordingly, and the results seem to be just as good. So you might be every month, some people are every two months, three months, but the vast majority of people will require treatment for life at the present time. Um, and that's, that's the uh, story for macular degeneration, at least. And you mentioned vitamins being prescribed. So um, do vitamins help in both dry and wet AMD? And how do they help with the uh, condition? So nobody really knows why, but I might get this wrong, so don't, don't quote me on this, but I, I believe the first studies were done because there were a lot of supplements on the market, and there was concern that um, people are trying to sell uh, vitamins for vision loss, and that perhaps it was slightly unethical because there was no good evidence for it. And so the NIH did trials on this for cataract and for macular degeneration. It didn't have any effect on cataracts and their progression, but it did help macular degeneration, and they had a formulation that was very effective. And so it reduces um, severe vision loss by almost half. I mean, oh, I'm sorry, by 20%. Um, so it's a very, very um, good, sort of cheap, safe medication, or not a medication, but micronutrient and vitamin that you can take that will, pro will, will reduce the risk of vision loss. And how it works, we don't really know, but it does seem to prevent the wet type of macular degeneration. Great. Um, so just lastly, before we, we uh, move to glaucoma, what, what would you say, or what do you feel are the most promising uh, treatments or things coming down the line for AMD? So for patients with macular degeneration, the most promising things are pro probably in three categories. So for the dry type of macular degeneration where we have no treatment, um, we're currently wrapping up some trials that show a tremendous effect of some newer medications for the dry type in, in a subpopulation of those patients. For the wet type, of, um, um, we're looking right now in the short term of drugs that last longer and have better durability, uh, uh, get people their, their quality of life improved. And then at home testing, there are some of these OCT, uh, it's called optical coherence tomography. It's, a, it's an imaging device for, for those who haven't had it. Uh, it really follows disease very well. And now that we can make it at home and you can actually do them in your house and ha have a daily scan and see how you're doing. So um, these kinds of fronts are very exciting. And then the long term is really sort of stem cell and gene therapy. Great, thank you. We will have some questions at the end. So if you have some questions for Dr. Merker, just uh, wait and we'll have those uh, after our speakers. Uh, thank you, Dr. Merker, um, for sharing all of that. So Dr. Gill, I'm gonna introduce uh, now. Uh, Dr. Gill is a glaucoma and cataract surgeon here in Vancouver. He specializes in all types of glaucoma surgery, performing both traditional and minimally invasive glaucoma procedures. So Dr. Gill, why don't we start out kind of the same way? Uh, what is glaucoma and how does it cause vision loss? Sure. Thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, so when we're talking about glaucoma, it's interesting. Um, um, glaucoma has no real presenting um, 
vision findings, most of our patients actually are diagnosed by good optometric examinations. They go to their optometrist and, and uh, um, it's noted just on a clinical exam that they might be at risk for glaucoma. And so I would say the majority of our patients that we do diagnose with glaucoma actually come in with an early diagnosis of suspicions of glaucoma with their optic nerve or elevated eye pressures. And in general, glaucoma really has no um, presenting symptoms of vision loss. Uh, so it, it is a little bit uh, undetected. Um, and, you know, recent studies even in Canada have shown that uh, we're probably under diagnosing glaucoma by about 50% in, in the country. Just because patients just don't go for eye exams uh, uh, routinely, uh, whereas in macular degeneration or in uh, cataracts, they do present with um, decreased vision. Uh, so that, I would say, is the first presenting sign of glaucoma is that it actually is not detected through everyday life. Um, now, some of the risk factors of glaucoma uh, would be you know, a strong family history of glaucoma, age, uh, as well as, you know, uh, uh, racial background, we tend to see uh, it a little bit more predominant in, in our Asian, African, or Hispanic communities. Uh, uh, but I would say that uh, even our patients who have very advanced glaucoma, um, they're still reading the eye chart very well. Like, they'll come into our uh, exam room and they'll still see 20-20 uh, 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 out of their affected eye. But it's the dimming of light in the room that, that is really causing uh, vision loss. So as Dr. Merker pointed out earlier about peripheral vision loss, as uh, the human eye, we can usually detect in our central 10 degrees of what we can and cannot see. Uh, but in our peripheral vision, it goes undetected. But I often tell our patients that it's, it's someone slowly dimming the light in the room and we're just not noticing it. Uh, so glaucoma in general very much goes unpresented until someone gets an eye exam done. So, so, what, so what sort of tests um, would the eye doctor do that would detect glaucoma or that would signify that the glaucoma might be uh, happening? Sure, so um, the first uh, things that we do for diagnostic testing is doing a visual field test, uh, I'm sure some patients have done it already where you sit in a, in a dome and press a clicker and there's lights flashing uh, in your peripheral vision uh, to start detecting certain amounts of peripheral vision loss. Recently now we also have very good scanners where we're actually detecting structural nerve damage uh, on the optic nerve, uh, uh, scanning the optic nerve head for uh, loss of retinal ganglion cells. Uh, uh, as well as um, a good clinical exam. Uh, if we look at glaucoma, glaucoma is a disease of the optic nerve, and uh, what we tend to notice is an enlargement of the optic nerve uh, that can sometimes show early structural changes, as well as uh, intraocular pressure uh, would be the other um, clinical exam. A majority of our patients sometimes just go to go get glasses and uh, the optometrist has screened them to check their intraocular uh, pressure, and they're noted in having high eye pressure. Uh, and so that's usually a, uh, probably the number one uh, way that patients are getting screened. So we recently had a, a viewpoint online about glaucoma, and one of the big takeaways for me from that was this idea that, you know, I think I always thought that if you have high eye pressure, you're at risk for glaucoma, but is that always the case? It, it, or can people have normal pressure and still develop glaucoma? Great question. Um, it's interesting. Uh, we see it on both sides. There's some patients who come in with very high eye pressures, and yet uh, they don't have glaucoma, right? And uh, uh, they have very thick corneal tissue, and so we can't really check eye pressures like we check pressures in a in a ball or a, or a tire by sticking a gauge in the eye, we have to push on the eye. And there's some patients who are just have very thick tissues, and we and they abnormally we're just detecting higher pressures than they actually have. Uh, however, there are some other patients who have normal eye pressures, 
and they can still develop glaucoma. And that's about 10% of our patients where they can develop normal tension glaucoma, where their eye pressures are still normal, and yet they're still too high for them, right? And, and so um, it's very important that when patients are getting screened for glaucoma, that we're just not just checking their pressures, but we're also doing diagnostic tests for the back of their eye. Because uh, the majority of patients we see in clinic uh, are patients who've kind of fallen through the cracks where they've been getting their eye pressures checked every year, or every two years, but no one has done any diagnostic testing in the back of their eye, and, and they are developing what we call normal pressure glaucoma. I think it's just another testament to getting those regular eye exams too, because what someone's baseline normal might be might be very different mm -hmm. from person to person, so monitoring that over time obviously would give you an indication as well. Um, so what, what treatments are currently available for glaucoma? So for treatment, the majority of our patients are treated with topical eye drops uh, uh, in the form of lowering the interocular pressure. When we look at glaucoma, um, we can't change people's age or their family history, which are risk factors, but one of the modifiable risk factors is pressure. Um, so the majority of patients we're treating are with eye drops. Uh, basically because they're the safest treatment that we have. Um, if patients can develop side effects of allergies and red eyes, and there's different types of medications we can switch them to. In, in some of our other patients, if drops aren't working, we can do laser treatment, uh, again, in the form of trying to reduce their intraocular eye pressure. And finally, if lasers and drops are not working, the final step is to do glaucoma surgery, where we can lower the pressures by making new fil uh, filtering, by putting filtering devices in the eye to, to reduce the pressure. However, surgery does come with inherent risks, and we usually try to reserve surgery uh, for those patients uh, uh, where we've exhausted all the safe options first. So similarly to talking about uh, with Dr. Merker about different types of injections, I'm assuming there's different types of glaucoma drops. And how do you determine you know, what drops are the best for a patient? Yeah, so drops all come from um, different ways of reducing eye pressure. So if we think about the eye like a bathtub with a tap and a drain, um, the majority of our drops either work on the drainage channel to try to improve um, the um, flow outside of the eye, or we work on the tap of the eye where we're pu putting in drops to reduce the eye in making fluid. Uh, but we also look at side effect profiles. Uh, there are certain drops which only have ocular side effects and not system systemic side effects. And we usually start our patients on drops that have minimal systemic side effects. Uh, uh, and if those aren't working, then we usually start them on medications that will have systemic side effects. There are certain glaucoma drops that can interact with, with your receptors on your lungs for breathing and your heart rate. Um, so it's much more, um, we kind of triage drops based on a patient's medical history and try them on the safest drops first before we start uh, escalating therapy to, to drops that might have other systemic side effects. And I noticed in your bio, it, it says that you perform both traditional and minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries. So what, what are the different types of surgery that someone might have for glaucoma? Sure. Um, again, if we use like the bathtub analogy with glaucoma, um, about 10 or 15 years ago, all we had for glaucoma treatment was to put a new hole through the side of the bathtub or put a new hole into the eye, right? Uh, um, which did come with a lot of risks of uh, doing something very abnormal to the eye uh, and having other risks of eye pressures going too low and other morbidities associated with uh, doing abnormal surgeries to the eye. So we do now, in the last 10 years, have newer surgeries where we can start working on the, on the drainage channel in the eye uh, to try to encourage better flow through pre-existing um, drainage channels that are in the eye where we're using different types of stents, uh, different types of blades to um, basically enhance 
the eye's natural filtration uh, to reduce the pressures, but also for patient recovery and lifestyle where patients are able to enjoy a better quality of life uh, with less invasive surgery. And, and not all minimal invasive surgeries work. And then we often reserve the larger surgeries for patients who failed uh, the, the less invasive surgeries. So it sounds like there's lots of steps that you go through, you know, first through the medication and then through surgery to try to improve or get the best outcome for any patient. Absolutely. I mean, I always tell our patients that uh, having glaucoma and when we're changing medications that uh, this is all just part of the, the algorithm of treatment. Uh, we can't cure their disease, but there are ways to slow down the disease and, and let patients enjoy a good quality of life uh, while maintaining their current level of vision. And so my last question is, uh, again, very similar to what I asked Dr. Merker. What, what do you see as the most promising treatments or surgeries that might be coming down the line or research that's happening into glaucoma right now? Well, I would say then uh, there's a few exciting things happening. Um, one would be, I would say the number one thing I hear from my patients is, you know, why do I have to come in to get my eye pressures checked? Is there not like a home pressure monitoring kit or something that I can do to, to measure my pressures at home? And there are certain devices out there, but their reliability indices aren't the, aren't the greatest. And I would say that they do cause a lot of undue stress on our patients. I mean, we have some of our patients checking their eye pressures at 2 a.m. and then they're coming into the office at 8 a.m., right? Uh, concerned about their eye pressures. So um, there are some newer um, devices coming out and even exciting things of like contact lenses that you can put in the eye that will be measuring pressures throughout the day that would be very helpful. So I think there's a lot of things for at-home monitoring that are coming. And then uh, in regards to drops, um, uh, patients forget to put their drops in and it's hard to kind of um, adhere to drop therapy when when there's a hard way to actually um, manifest or, or understand your disease. Uh, uh, you know, when our blood sugars go up or our, 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 our blood pressures go up, we do feel it, but with eye pressures, we don't. And, and so there is an issue of patient compliance about getting drops in. Uh, and there are some newer things coming out now uh, in the form of injections where we, you know, in the next couple of years, we will be able to do a lot more uh, treatment uh, of, of doing injections that are slow release uh, into the eye that will help to uh, have sustained release and, and, and control the disease and, and maybe give patients a better quality of life. Well, that sounds great. Well, thank you so much. Again, we'll have questions uh, for Dr. Gill at the end. Uh, so our final panelist today is Dr. Jean Chuo, who I have to say, um, my inner nerd is coming out because I just noticed the dress that she's wearing, which is a periodic table. It's amazing. I love it so much. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> so Dr. Cho is a, Cho is a consulting ophthalmologist at the Vancouver General Hospital and St. Paul's Hospital uh, and operates at uh, Mount St. Joseph Hospital. Uh, she has special interest in small incision cataract surgeries and is a fellowship trained subspecialist in neuro-ophthalmology. Uh, welcome, Dr. Cho. Uh, so let's, let's talk about cataracts. So what is a cataract and uh, what causes them to occur? Um, my microphone? Perfect. Um, thank you for having me. Cataract, and I wish I'd brought my uh, slides if I would known Dr. Merker was going to do that. I didn't want to be nerdier than I am already. So um, I do, it, is it possible to put up one of Dr. Merker's slides? I just need the anatomy of the eye. It's, it's hard to conjure up the eye in, in thin air. There we go. Uh, go. That, that's good. That's good. Yeah, exactly. Dr. Merker is pointing to where cataract would be. So I always like to tell my patient that the eyeball is like a camera. And I think most, thank you, most of you in the room, I'm hoping, um, would remember what a traditional camera looks like. Um, unfortunately, I see some kids and, and recently, you know, I saw a little, I think it's a four-year-old, and um, we, you know they don't quite know their letter yet, and so we have these picture charts. And one of them has got a traditional rotary dial phone, right? And I put that up, and she looks at me, and she said, a dress? So you know, um, obviously she saw that, and she thought there was two puffy sleeves. So anyway, if you think of the eyeball as a traditional camera, 
And um, so where Dr. Merker was talking about uh, is uh, the retina, and the retina is, if I could, where's the button? Um, the retina, that helps. The retina is back here, as Dr. Merker pointed out too, and it's like the film of the camera. So you can imagine if there's a smudge on the film of the camera, which is like macular degeneration, it doesn't matter what you do to the rest of the camera, the lenses or whatnot, you're not gonna take a good picture in that spot. Now, what Dr. Gill was talking about was glaucoma. Glaucoma is mainly a disease of the nerve. Now, you can imagine the nerve is what connects the camera, say, to the computer where it actually offloads all your images. So you can have as good of a film, as good of a lens, if your cable that's connecting the camera to the computer is broken you're not gonna see, because after all, it is the brain that sees. So those are the two diseases. Now, those diseases, unfortunately, as you've heard so far, we can't cure them, because the retina and the nerve of the eye is actually, they're both outpouchings of the brain. Um, it's just part of the brain that we get to see. And guess what? We don't know how to fix the brain yet as much as we like to, so therefore we can't quite fix these two diseases. I'm in the perfect position where I actually can fix the disease I'm gonna talk about because it's not part of the brain. It is basically the lens of the camera. So you can imagine a dirty lens of the camera. I can change that. I get rid of the lens and I give you a new lens. It's amazing. So why, what is cataract? Cataract is the lens that we're born with. It's crystal clear, it lets light into the eye. It actually focuses the light so it goes directly to the retina in a pinpoint, hopefully, and, and it basically shines that image onto the film for you to see, for it to get passed into the nerve, into your brain. You can imagine if you have dirty lens in the, in the camera, you're not going to see because that light is going to get scattered everywhere because it doesn't have a clear medium. As we age, unfortunately, the lens that we're born with becomes incapable of clearing all the protein aggregates that it produces. And so eventually you get more and more protein inside the lens that becomes cloudy or opacified, and then the light gets scattered. And that's pretty much what cataract is. Thank you, that was a great explanation. So who is at risk for cataracts? I know we talk about, um, we're talking about age-related uh, vision loss today, but is, is cataract always associated with age? And are there any sort of pre-existing conditions that might make someone more susceptible to developing a cataract? Absolutely. Even though I would say, I say to most of my patients, you know, if in your lifetime you don't have cataract surgery, you likely die too early. Because it, it is a age-associated disease, and as we live longer and longer, each eyeball will likely have a cataract that needs to be dealt with because it starts to affect your function in daily life uh, during your lifetime. However, they are genetic uh, conditions and pre- uh, sort of medical conditions as well, as well as inherited conditions that would predispose certain individuals to cataract earlier in life. First of all, they're congenital cataract. And during development of the eye, the lens itself did not develop properly, and there are uh, opacifications within those, ca uh, those lens that uh, even during um, you know, childhood or during infancy. Um, there are other conditions genetically, such as Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, for example, where the gene that is defective in these conditions also causes cataract. Now, medically, uh, our, you know, some individuals, say, with organ transplants would be needing to be on high-dose immunosuppressants, which includes corticosteroid medications. Now, steroid has a side effect of uh, cataract development, especially with prolonged use. And interestingly, that even goes to nasal steroids for allergies. Um, if you use it long enough, there are certain more susceptible individuals will develop cataract uh, earlier in life. 
So I assume there is a stage for, for surgery for cataracts. So you, if someone has a cataract, you wouldn't necessarily just immediately operate. They would have to get to a certain point before you would choose to operate. So what is that point? And then what is the surgery sort of look like? What happens for during a cataract surgery? Yeah, again, I, I wish I brought my uh, slides. I actually have a little cute video that shows what cataract surgery is about. Um, but good, very good uh, comment in that, you know, just because you have cataract doesn't mean we're gonna jump on you and take out the cataract right away. After all, cataract is part of aging. And back in the caveman times, guess what? We all kind of die before cataract forms, right? Um, and it is just part of us. So it doesn't really, uh, it's benign. It's benign until it starts to affect your function. And as I mentioned before, we live much longer now, and we are much more functional to even later in life. So we still have 80-year-olds driving. And so for those people, and for a majority of people actually, driving is a big deal. And when your vision has decreased to the extent where you do not meet the driving standard, it's usually one um, sort of uh, threshold that we would use to evaluate the need for cataract surgery. Others would like to have their cataract dealt with earlier on because they need to drive at night or they have a job that requires detailed fine vision under bright light. And remember, cataract bounces off light and the light gets reflected. And so not only you don't see very well, things also seem a bit brighter and more glary. And so for say a jeweler, for example, they may want their cataract surgery done sooner. So it's individualized. In in terms of when we would take out your cataract, and mainly it's based on function. So once someone has the surgery, has a cataract removed, is it, could it come back? Oh, yeah, I didn't quite answer what the cataract surgery is about, didn't I? I'm sorry, Morgan. Okay. So backtracking. Um, so cataract surgery, like I said, it's mainly we remove your lens, the cloudy lens, we give you an artificial lens back. We used to just remove the lens because we didn't have the knowledge or the technology to make an artificial lens. Um, you know, if you can remember 50 years ago, there may be movies or documentaries where there are older people with thick, thick glasses. Now, those are individuals likely that had cataract surgery but did not have a lens implant. And because there's no lens in the eye to focus the eye, what they do is we give them a pair of glasses to focus the eye, uh, focus the light outside of the eye. And that's how thick that lens would be um, outside of the eye to focus the light into the eye. So cataract's about one centimeter large. So when you think about surgery and we're removing a one centimeter large thing, you think the wound, the cut, will need to be about one centimeter to get that out. So that used to be the case. We used to cut a pretty giant hole in the eye. Uh, the eyeball's only two and a half you know, centimeters. And, and, and we literally squeeze out the cataract and out comes the little lens. And you know, it's almost like delivering a baby sometimes. And <laughs> the issue with that is the lens comes out, but you know, sometimes part of the rest of the eye comes out too. And that's not good. Um, so complication rates were high back then. And thank goodness, technology has involved, uh, evolved so you know quite a bit since. And now what we do is a small incision cataract surgery. The surgery involves a wound about 2.7 millimeters or less. Um, and how do we get out, get the big lens out of a tiny little hole? We basically would break the cataract apart with ultrasound into tiny little pieces. And we suck it out, almost like with a vacuum, um, a little piece at a time through that little wound. And you can imagine then once the cataract gets sucked out, in its place, we can then put in that artificial lens. Um, that lens, again, need to be roughly the same size as your original lens, which is again, one centimeters. So technology, again, has, has evolved so, such that we can actually fold the lens. It's soft. It's almost like gummy bear. We can roll it up like a newspaper roll. We put it in through a tiny little incision that we made to take out the cataract. And the lens slowly unfolds after we have positioned it in the right spot. And that's pretty much your surgery. 
Well, thank you. That was an incredibly vivid description. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, and also to answer your next question, Morgan, um, it's um, sorry. Remind me of the question. Oh, it, can can a cataract come back? After yes. Surgery? So cataract itself does not come back. Okay, it's like your appendix. It's like your gallbladder. Once it's gone, it's gone. However, the lens that we put in your eye. Um, can get cloudy. Now, how does that work? It's not the lens itself that gets cloudy. It's that our body will create a scar around the lens to hold the lens in place. Eventually, that scarring will go to the center of the lens where we see through. And it's going to feel as if you, your cataract comes back because it's a memory. And again, it's a cloudy membrane that you can't see through. And that's something that we call posterior capsular opacification. It's a long mouthful, but basically scarring in the center of your artificial lens. That's sometimes people call it secondary cataract, but it is not a cataract. That's easily dealt with. We use a laser. We basically polish the center of your lens, and that scarring will never go back to the center again. That's, that's, that's great. So I, I love that you talked about 56 years ago. So my favorite cataract fact is that the impressionist artist Claude Monet actually had cataract surgery, and that was a very long time ago. So this surgery has been around for, for a long time. Um, so just my last question, are there any you know, innovations or new things that you see coming down in terms of cataract research that are, are going to kind of push the needle forward for cataract surgery or treatment? So one of the biggest questions that my patients always ask me when I say, yes, you need cataract surgery, because this thought of surgery in the eye, it, it can be quite scary for a lot of people, is uh, are there drops or pills that I can take to slow this down, to get rid of it? The answer is no. Um, not so far. I know that there are quite, uh, there, there's some research, especially in Asia, for drops that will slow down the development of cataract. Uh, I must say it does work, but it works very little. And given the fact that everybody lives so long, you may just delay the cataract surgery in yourself by five years if you take that drop faithfully for 20 years. <laughs> so um, in terms of drops and um, you know pills, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of research in the horizon, given the fact that cataract surgery is so successful. Uh, it essentially cures the condition. So more innovation in the horizon would be to make surgery even more e efficient. Um, the surgery itself now takes about 10 minutes. So it is already quite efficient. But little things that we can do would be making the wound even smaller, making the ultrasound machine that we use to break up a cataract and suck it out even more efficient. Um, and the lenses lens implant that we put in the eye, um, even more uh, you know, innovative in the sense that it can decrease your dependency on glasses after surgery, um, on reading glasses, on uh, glasses looking in the distance, et cetera. So I see that's where most innovation is coming from when it comes to cataract treatment, um, you know, to, to at least make it so then there's a bit of carrot, you know, to go through the surgery. It actually does improve your vision at the end of that. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. So we have a few minutes remaining and we'd love to get any questions from the audience. So Larissa has a microphone over there. And if you wave your hand, we will come over to you um, and you can ask your questions. Hi, thank you. This question is for Dr. Merker. You mentioned uh, vitamin supplements. Yeah. Is there any formations that are designed, for example, for Stargardt's disease? And if you could give this to us or after perhaps. Uh... Thank you. Uh, the answer is I wish. So it was studied specifically in patients with macular degeneration. And, and unfortunately, we can't really um, translate that, that to any other conditions. And so the concern is always, can we make people worse? And we certainly have do done that in medicine. And, and so we caution people to use these vitamins, that it's for macular degeneration, not for myopic degeneration or inherited diseases of the present time. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I was wondering about for cataracts, is there an optimum time during cataract development for surgery to be done? That's a great question. Yes, there is. Um, 
because of the the improvement in uh, surgical techniques and uh, in terms of and, and also decrease in surgical risk, I would say that optimal time has moved earlier and earlier in the last while during cataract formation. Definitely don't get it done if it's not affecting your vision. If you're still 20, 20, 20, 25, you know, I would say the risk of surgery outweighs your benefit, unless there are other ocular issues involved. Um, the optimal time would be usually when it's starting to bother you. And in some people, in an 80 year old woman who doesn't drive, that would be, oh, I can't see the stairs too, too well anymore to navigate up and down um, in terms of depth perception. But in a 60, 70 year old who are really still active would be the glare when I'm driving at nighttime is really bothering me. Or I now need to turn on the light to the max when I'm reading and it still sometimes doesn't feel enough. So I'm sorry that's a long question, but uh, a long answer, but basically it's quite individual and it's when it starts to bother you enough where you kind of go, I do want to do something about it. I uh, also a question for Dr. Merker uh, regarding uh, AMD. I guess there's two parts. Uh, one thing is I'm wondering if you've seen many changes or improvements to the uh, injection treatments in the past the three years, the morning since 2019. And the second part of my question would be, in terms of the new therapies that are coming or the gene therapy, can you talk about which AMD patients would be eligible for those? So two, two big questions. Um, in terms of the first one, um, the therapies and the change over time, there's been a lot of changes. Um, I don't know if the question's about the new medications that are coming out or how they're administered. Or oh. Oh, I see. Yeah. So it's hard to know. So everybody would be, that would be individualized. We'd have to see the patient again. Uh, but, but for the vast majority of people, the treatments really haven't, um, they, they have may, maybe improved. It's hard to really say, but they're likely about on par. Uh, what we're really looking at now is durability. So they go a bit longer, say two months or four months now um, with some of these medications. Um, but that's really about it right now. In terms of the gene therapies, um, there's two ways to approach this, and it's, it's interesting to, to think about. You can insert a gene, you can put a virus that will infect the cells and get them to produce different you know, genetic products, which are proteins. And so um, we, can, we can inject actually a virus that can infect the retinal cells and get them to produce these medications themselves in the eye. And that's been shown to be very successful and very exciting. That's sort of the first step is to get your body to produce the medications that we're injecting. And that's exciting. And that's coming up, I think, pretty soon in terms of some of the results of, of these major trials. The other area, area is curing the underlying problem. And that's a much harder problem. Um, and that'll probably take a bit longer. But uh, certainly, there's a lot of effort on that front, too. Uh, my question is just a, a general a curiosity. What is the coincidence of? the disease eye diseases that you're speaking about um, in your practice you do you find that there's an instance of a couple or is there three that show up or how is that so i'll just i'll give my version of it but there there are three conditions that tend to occur in similar populations and so you can have the cataract is sort of the constant that would be the most common mm -hmm. And then a percentage will have macular degeneration, a percentage will have glaucoma, and some will have cataract and both. Or uh, I don't know if you guys want to try that question. Yeah, uh, <laughs> absolutely. I, I agree. Um, everybody in this room, including us, if we live long enough, we're going to have two cataracts, one in each eye. That's the guarantee, yeah. The macular degeneration is about to say 15% yeah. of populations and glaucoma is a percentage as well, but the yeah. cataract is the guarantee. 100%. <laughs> I would say that there's some of our patients who often ask me like, why am I seeing more than one eye doctor, right? Uh, and um, it's because we mutually share a lot of patients together uh, uh, as each patient you know, deserves the expertise of a different subspecialist for their eye care. I think here. there's Thank an you. alarm or something going off too. If, if they can turn that off, that'd be great. 
Thank you all for a wonderful presentation. My question is pertaining to the cataracts. Uh, my daughter is, um, has been on immunosuppressants since she was 12 years old. Um, she, is, um, she was on um, corticosteroids, which have impacted her lens. So she has to now go for the surgery, cataract surgery. She is barely 20 years old. Um, and so my question is, when you do the surgery and you put an implant, um, are you kind of looking at somebody putting that implant who is seven years old or 60 years old, eight years old versus 20 years old? And so also the second part of that is, um, what um, what kind of, because she is gonna be on this immunosuppressants for a long time. She's got a uveitis, it's gonna be a long time, she's got rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and so what kind of impact the immunosuppressants and the corticosteroids will have impact on a new implant and you know, next hopefully 60 years or does she need another surgery? Thank you for answering it. Those are great questions, and um, the lens implants that we that I talked about, we obviously tend to implant those in people who are older, um, just because in general that's it's a cataract is is a patient you know in in the older population, but there are patients like your daughter who have premature cataract because of other issues. I must say, luckily. Uh, at age 20, her eyeball doesn't tend to grow anymore. And the lens implant and the power as well as the size of the implant, it, it's dependent on the size of the eyeball mostly. And so in her, I would say it's the same as if I were implanting the lens in a 70-year-old. Now, the next question usually from patients who are younger to me would be, how long is my implant going to last? Um, from our knowledge, that implant, because it is plastic, it's an inert plastic, is gonna last as long as your daughter. Um, it, the quality of the implant tend not to change over time, fingers crossed, as far as we know. Um, and, uh, and since the eyeball is not growing any, anymore, the, the, also the need for the power and the size of the implant will not change. Um, now, what sometimes can happen because of you know, other diseases in the eye that can also be induced by steroids, the, um, you know, the capsule as well as the support system for that lens may get weaker. And if that's the case, then the lens may become not so stable and the secondary surgery may be needed to stabilize that lens. Um, further changes, due to the steroid uh, on that lens really is it's not nothing at all. Um, there's not much that the steroid can do to that lens. Like I said, if she is on cortical steroids for life, it can impact other parts of the eye rather than lens itself. Okay, great, I think we have time for one last question. Uh, it's for Dr. Merkel. Uh, you spoke on AMD. Um, are you going to be addressing GA also and the chances of inheriting geographic atrophy? So, so geographic atrophy is kind of a, a non-specific term, but we hear it most commonly with macular degeneration. So that's very, very correct. And that's sort of an end stage of the macular degeneration that we don't really have treatment for right now. Um, there are some exciting new new drugs um, that are coming out. We've done two trials, uh, two of the trials for both the drug or candidates that are coming. Um, but there's also some surgical developments and research, but we're still in the research phase. So ge geographic atrophy, I, I assume you're referring to macular degeneration, correct? Is that correct? Dry AMD. That's correct, yeah. So yeah. Mac, the dry type, yeah, that's right. So we don't have any treatments, and a lot of, but there's a lot of research and cutting edge innovations that are coming, but right now we have nothing. Well, what are the chances of inheriting geographic atrophy? So, yeah, so, so macular degeneration has, has a strong inheritance to it, but it's not like our inherited retinal diseases that are usually more of the 
the classic genetics that people think of where a risk to the children is sort of, you know, you know 50% or a quarter of the kids will get it. It's, it's much more complex. And the genetics we don't fully understand yet for geographic atrophy subtype or, or the progression to geographic atrophy. So we don't really have much in terms of treatments, but as I said, there's a lot of exciting new developments.